this morning, I, I just want to share very briefly with you. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to preach. Isn't that wonderful? I'll just share, share uh, some scripture with you and, and, and take the opportunity of making some comments. But in a, a few weeks ago, Pastor Steve uh, uh, had been speaking to us about, first of all, uh, digging ditches. And those were ditches of, of, of preparation for blessing. And, and God was going to pour out his blessing in your life. And, and you were making preparations. Like the, the lady who God was going to bless with extra oil. And she got all the pots and pans that she could get. Because the more pots and pans she had, the more blessing she would be receiving. And then he also talked about, he went on from that to show how things make a difference in when we change the atmosphere. In fact, he was telling me he was coming from the hospital and I think it was one of those trips where he went and he didn't have the, the uh, MRI as he had hoped to have got. I think he went about three times before he finally got that. But one, one time he was coming back and you know how our pastor, he doesn't complain. But I don't, he must have said something to make Caleb say, change the atmosphere. <laughs> and, and so our kids are watching. Our kids are listening and they're watching to see what kind of atmosphere we are living in and what we are creating. And remember this, your children don't hear so much what you say, but they watch what you do. But, but he went on to show that this atmosphere was changed. And the situation we face, and, and some of you um, have not been here, so, so let me go back a little bit. And those of you who have been here uh, have patience with me. But it was Second Kings 3, and it was a situation where Joram, the son of Ahab, you know who Ahab was? Well, okay, if you don't remember, let me tell you, he was the husband of Jezebel. Aha, uh -huh, now I think you're getting to recognize who we are. This was a wicked king of Israel who didn't obey God, who, who, who worshipped idols and, and led the whole nation of Israel into sin. There's something else which I think uh, uh, those of you who are Bible students understand, but those of you who probably read it but didn't realize, is that at this point, God's children, God's, God's people, the children of Israel, had been separated into two nations, literally. There was, there was Israel in the north with about ten tribes, and in the south was Judah with two tribes, mainly Judah and Benjamin. You don't hear very much about Benjamin, but, but, but it, it, it was two kingdoms and two kings. And, and this is how, uh, uh, because of their disobedience, God's children was broken into two. But Israel in the north really represented a backslider. Because they had gone away so much from God. And, and they were directed and ruled by a king who was an ungodly man, Joram. And I see J uh, Joram as kind of a, like a backslidden Christian. And in fact, what had happened was, was that the nation of Israel was depending upon the, the, the Moabites to supply them with certain goods and services. And what happened is the Moabites must have gotten into bad times and they decided, you know what? We're going to get these Israelites off our backs. We ain't going to give them anything anymore. And that's what happens when you, when you depend upon the world's resources. Okay, see, God is our source and everything else are resources. And so, sometimes the resources dry up. And so Joram was depending upon his Moabites to supply him, and the supply had been cut off, and so he decided that he'd have a war. But the thing that bothers me was that Jehoshaphat, who was the king of Judah, who was a godly man, who was an obedient to God, who did what God told him to do, he followed in the ways of his father Asa, who was a good king before him. He listened to what Joram had to say. He took advice from Joram and he left his throne in Judah, went up to Israel to go fight a battle which had nothing to do with him. Here is a Christian who should know better taking advice and running shoulders to shoulder with a backslider. And you know, sometimes I, I wonder if, if sometimes Christians aren't indicted by the fact that we, we, we're sometimes closer to unsaved and backslidden people than we are to Christians, to our fellow Christians, and we backbite them and we talk about them and we, 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 we take counsel together with them. But not only that, this duo took on the king of uh, Edom. Edom, which really was originally uh, Israel's enemy. They got into this ungodly, uh, I didn't want to say trinity because there was no, no, nothing even close to what the godly trinity is. But there was this, this trio of evil. 
decided to fight a war. And it wasn't long before they got into trouble. But praise God, God still loved his servant Jehoshaphat. And the Bible tells us God knows those who are his, his. And sometimes we get into trouble and sometimes we get all mixed up. But you know what? God still loves you. And whatever situation we find ourselves in, God is still working to pull us out. He took, he took Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he'll take you out of the situation you are in when you're ready to come out. And so because of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat said, there is, there's got to be a prophet of God. Let's hear him. And so eventually that's how Elisha was, was sought and brought. And of course, Elisha recognized what was going on. And he decided, he said, he said to the king of, of Israel, I don't even want, to, want to have anything to do with you because you're an ungodly man. But just because of this man of God, do you know that we are the salt of the earth? Do you know that because Christians are in the world, this world still enjoys some kind of peace and prosperity and life? That's what it means that we are the salt of the earth. We still flavor this earth. But God helped this earth when the church is raptured out of it. And so because of Jehoshaphat, Elisha brought a message from God. He brought the answer. And so God told him to dig ditches because there was going to be rain. They were all thirsty. After seven days, the army had run out of water. How can you fight a battle without water? Your soldiers have no water to drink. They were going to die. And so they were in a quandary. And so Elisha brought the word of God. And what Elisha told them was to dig ditches. But that came about in a certain situation because it didn't take place until Elisha said, bring the minstrels. And what do the, minst the minstrels are? The minstrels are the people who play the music, sing the songs, and lead people into worship. You notice I didn't say they worship, they lead people into worship. And as they led people into worship, as worship was, was being poured out to God, the Spirit of God came upon Elisha. And Elisha prophesied and brought the message of God. And so they changed the atmosphere. Because you see, God, God doesn't like pity parties. You know, some people figure, well, then the re how God is going to answer them is that they're going to go on their knees and they're going to call tears, quiet tears, and they're going to holler and bawl. And I'm not saying people shouldn't cry before God. But you know what? Most of our crying should be because of our sins. Hello? If you want to weep and mourn, that's what the Bible says. Cry for your sins. Cry for your weakness. But, if, but, but, but God, God doesn't move in power and, and, and miracles in, in necessary in sorrow and so on. He, he's not going to join your pity party. But when, when the people started to pray and work, praise and worship God and sing songs, the power of God came down. You know, God is looking for us, our people who will praise him. The Bible said God inhabits the praises of his people. When we begin to praise and worship God, God is ready to move. And that's why the, the, the worship leader said this morning, while you are worshiping and praising, expect God to heal you. Amen. While you raise your hand and your heart in worship to God, expect God to do the work. That you, he's, he, 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 you asked him to do. And so, Pastor Steve started with a with message, change the atmosphere. And this morning, all I want to do is just to continue that a little bit. And let us look some more at this whole matter of changing the atmosphere. So, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Second Chronicles 20. Because you see, whatever you read in First and Second Kings, you'll sometimes find some parallels in first and second chronicles and 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 we we don't read some more more about uh, jehoshaphat in 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 second chronicles 20 and remember this that all that takes place with the nation of israel is a sample of how god works and how things work and how life works in the children of israel that's is an example for us not necessary to follow Sometimes to be advised by, sometimes to be corrected by. But God uses the life of the nation of Israel to demonstrate to us. And there are some things I'd like us to see as we read through Second Chronicles 20. And I don't know if we can do it in these next few minutes. But we're going to try. And it says there, it happened after this, that. It happened after this, what? You see... 
as we read about Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat had made some mistakes in his life. The, the mistake he made with Joram wasn't the first one. He made the same thing with, his, with Joram's father, Ahab. And one time, he, he just escaped with his life. Barely made it. But after that, Jehoshaphat had peace, the Bible said. He obeyed God. He taught his people to obey God. He, he tore down the Asherah poles, the idol worshiping. And Joram uh, changed and God worked through him so that there was peace in Judah. And even though there was wickedness and ungodliness going on in Israel, in Judah, there was blessing and harmony and the presence of God. But it says it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon, others with them besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Now here is a Christian walking, serving God, doing all that's right, uh, worshipping, paying their tithes, everything is happening. And then all of a sudden, calamity. Is, isn't a Christian supposed to have it good and hunky-dory? Isn't so, everything supposed to be good and right and peace and blessing? But here is this man enjoying all this blessing. And all of a sudden, calamity. A couple of weeks ago, our brother Moses Minter, who is... Uh, assigned to a Nigeria for the next few years, but he comes home every now and then for a, 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 a time of rest and to, get, to be with his family. And he got that telephone call that no parent, ever, no parent wished they'll ever get. Bad news. His son, promising young man, has his whole life before him, as it were, at 24 years. Had done more in that 24 years than many of us have or will do in our lifetime. Gone home to be with the Lord in an accident. All of a sudden, out of the blue, ladies and gentlemen, this is life. Bad things happen to good people. And the Bible, God never said that tribulations and temptations wouldn't come your way. But I want to tell you before I even move up, no matter what the temptation or the trial or the tribulation is that you think you're not going to be able to make it. The Bible said there hath no temptation taken you. There's nothing that comes your life, way that will make you want to give up on God, make you want to murmur against God. There's no temptation taken you except such as is common to man. Stuff happens, okay? But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above which you are able. But he is faithful. And with the temptation, he'll provide a way of escape that you will be able to bear it. So if it comes, you can bear it. It happened after this that the people of Moab, with the people of Ammon and others, rose up against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria. Bad news. I don't care who you are. If you haven't gotten it yet, bad news is going to come your way. And that's why the Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God. So that we'll be able to stand in the evil day. Ladies and gentlemen, evil days are coming as long as we're in this world. I'm not a prophet of, 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 of doom here. But I'm laying out the facts that the evil day will come. And the Bible says to watch for it and be prepared for it. But... Jehoshaphat got bad news. A whole army, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea of Syria. And they are in Hazazan, Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to help, to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Listen. You're not above fear. When sudden bad news take you, you can go into fear. But the question is here, what do you do with it? Can you see, all of a sudden, the atmosphere cheer, changed on Jehoshaphat. It was peace and safety and, and la, la, la. Everything was wonderful. And then all of a sudden, bad news. Threat of war, threat of death. Thousands and thousands of soldiers and people, even of his own life, all of a sudden the atmosphere changes to fear. But you know what? 
It's all part of life. These things happen. But you know, the Bible tells us that we're going to have things to fear about. We're going to have grief. But we're not going to grieve like other men. We're not going to grieve with people, like people who are in despair or dismay. We grieve, but we have a hope. We have a hope in our God. And so, even though he feared, even though he was afraid, the Bible tells us that uh, Jehoshaphat decided to seek God. The atmosphere changed on him. Things changed. He got a gift that he didn't ask for. He, things begin to happen to him that he didn't ask for. And I'm glad today because he was a man of God. He said, you know what? Let me seek God. Even in the, in the face of bad news, let me seek God. Seek God in the good times. Seek God in the bad times. But David said, what time I'm afraid, I will seek the Lord. If you haven't been seeking God before, you seek him in time of fear. Because God is not the kind of person who would say, well, you didn't pay me attention when things were good. So know that you're seeking me. I don't want to hear from you. That's not God. That's not God. Our God is a God that someone could say, it was grace that brought that fear. And grace that fear relieved. How precious did that grace appear the moment, the hour I first believed. So if you're in fear tonight, seek God. He'll not turn away from you. He'll hear you. He turned to God in fasting. And fasting is him exercising that, that, his, his right to go before God and say, God, I am nothing. I, I give up everything. I have nothing, no strength of my own. I am depending all upon you. And he, he repented and he, he fell before God in fasting. And I'm sure he was in sackcloth and ashes. And what he was saying, God, my faith is in you. And something else that Jehoshaphat did that I like. The Bible says he came to the house of God. It wasn't time to call his rich uncle. It wasn't time to call some ungodly person because they had resources. It wasn't time to go complain to somebody who likes to hear bad news. He went to the house of God. To me, it is always better to call a Christian brother or sister and say, pray with me. So Jehoshaphat went to the house of God because he knows God meets with his people. And so he sought the Lord. But let's re read on. Verse 5. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord, before the new court and said, O Lord. Jehoshaphat prayed. He said, O Lord, do not you... you and do you not rule over all the kingdoms? He said, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might? So that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever, and they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in your name? Do you think Jehoshaphat is trying to tell God something that God doesn't know? He says, aren't you the God who rule in heaven? Aren't you the sovereign God? Aren't you, aren't you the ruler over all? You rule over all the kingdoms and the nations of this earth and the, these people with their armies. Aren't you ruler over them? You see, Jehoshaphat was a acknowledging God. The Bible says in all your ways acknowledge him. Know who he is. And if you don't remember remind yourself. You see Jehoshaphat was changing his focus. The atmosphere changed on him. So Jehoshaphat instead of looking at, at himself he began to look at God. He turned from looking at his weakness. He turned from looking at the, the, the things that have changed and what can I do? Oh, he, he could stay mourning and weeping and, 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 and just complaining. Look at me, poor me. Why did this happen to me? But he changed and he looked at God. He said, you are the God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before you, before your people Israel. Change his focus. He prayed. He sought God. He, he reminded God of his very word. There's one of the, 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 the uh, Bible fellowship classes. They're going to be, they, they, they study and they pray, they study a book which talks about praying the word of God. It's not, you're not trying to throw things back 
in God's face. But when you pray the word of God, it means that you know what you're praying about, first of all. You know what God says. And, and, and the best prayer to pray is to pray what God says. The Bible says, I will never leave you or forsake you so that we might boldly say, I will not fear what men shall do unto me. I repeat back what God already said. Who can change that? Jehoshaphat reminded himself. He prayed God's word back to him. Saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, and pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in affliction, and you will hear and save. And now, hear all the people of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Do you sense a bit of complaining here? Jehoshaphat is saying, when Israel was on the move, we were going to destroy these people, but God just said, don't destroy them. Leave them alone. And here they are. Here they are. God, you see what you did? If you had allowed us to destroy them at that time when we would have destroyed them, we wouldn't have this problem right now. Have you ever heard anybody else blaming God for stuff like that? You remember anybody like that? Come on. You remember somebody blaming God for, 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 for God if it weren't for you? You think Christians do that? Do, do you think we take offense against God? You remember a few weeks ago, Brother Oswaki preached about uh, John the Baptist? Lord, look at me. I, I came and preached your word and I did all that you said to do and here I am in jail. What's going on, God? The one I want you to remember is old Adam. Remember? God, the woman you gave me. See, if it weren't for you, God, I wouldn't be in this problem. You should have kept that woman where she was, not bring her here. I know I got all these problems. These people, I, we could have destroyed them earlier, and you let us leave, and, and you let us, and here they are. Here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession. See that, God? But I'm so glad Jehoshaphat didn't remain in that self-pity situation. I tell you, every, every one of us sometimes, we have little flashes of that. You know, little, little times when, man, you, you have some kind of regret because somewhere along the line, you forgot that your whole life is in God's hand. You forgot that God wasn't sleeping when certain things took place. You thought maybe God had a little bit of a lapse here. God? And I'm glad Jehoshaphat didn't stay there. He continued because he wanted to change the atmosphere. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Jehoshaphat had a huge army. But you know what? Jehoshaphat recognized that this is not a way to go. He had learned his lesson. Let's turn to God. Jehoshaphat knew who God was. He knew who he was. And even though he had a large army, he wasn't going to trust himself. So Jehoshaphat began to stir up his faith and began to change the atmosphere. The Bible says stir up that faith, stir up that gift that is within you. You know, we're sitting around waiting for somebody to come and stir the waters for us. But God said, you, you stir up that, that gift that's in you. Verse 13 says, Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. They all gathered at the house of God to worship him. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benah, the son of Jeriel, the son of Matanah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. Anybody ever heard of anybody named Jez? What's his name? Jehaziel? Anybody? Never even heard of this guy before. So like some ordinary guy, you, couldn't, you, you had to be saying he's the son of this and the son of this and the son of that. Maybe somebody would recognize who we're talking about. Maybe. And nobody. And nobody in your sight, but somebody in God's eyes. Because when those people begin to praise and worship God, the Bible said the Spirit of God came down and brother, what's his name? Jehazah. What, brother Godfrey? Jehaziel. When the people began to worship God and stand before him, the spirit of God came down on this ordinary brother. 
Hello? Because in the, in the atmosphere of praise and worship, when you begin to stir up that, change that atmosphere, in the atmosphere of praise and worship, Jehaziel, Jehaziel begin to, to prophesy and to bring a word from God, a word in season. And he said, listen to what he said. Listen all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you king Jehoshaphat. Look at him. Talking to the king like that. Because the power of God and the authority of the Holy Spirit is speaking to him. He said, you king, listen. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but the battle is God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come out by the ascent of the seas. And you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Listen, God is calling somebody here to start praising and worshiping him. And position yourself. You've been asking God for an answer all this time. But are you ready? Are you ready to receive the blessing? And you know, I remember Pastor Earl always talked about a lady who used to pray for her husband. Pray that he'd be saved. Every Sunday after church, this lady would come and ask him to pray for her, her husband. And then the man got saved. And guess what? The sister disappeared. I heard this guy preaching on the radio one day and I said, wait a minute. Because after he got saved, he used to come to our... Um, um, uh, first things first class new discipleship class so when I heard his voice on the radio I said wait a minute that sounds familiar it's the same brother that the sister had prayed for all these years God is now using in evangelism and she backslide can you explain that to me the only explanation I have is that she didn't position herself to receive the blessing. And many of you are asking God to bring your, your child back or, or bring your husband back or bring your, 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 your wife back or whatever. You better be prepared to forgive them. You better be prepared to receive them and position yourself. And, and I've been young and I've been old and I've never seen job opportunities come knock at people's door. No, I, I know there's going to be some exception in this crowd to say, Pastor Bailey, I was in my bed under my blanket with the pillow on top of my head and all of a sudden there was a job knocking on my door. Okay? Most of us have to write resumes and somebody wrote a hundred and odd resumes and sent them out. Only one answer. But that's all he needed. He got the job. Because he was positioned himself. He was ready. He had all the preparation. You know, one time I was praying for our wife. I said, God, give me the best daughter you have. And one day I was praying, God asked me, can you deal with my best daughter? <laughs> and God changed my prayer. I said, Lord, make me husband material. And, and, and somebody this morning when, when Reverend Reagan prayed, you couldn't, you couldn't go close and hold anybody's hand, but you're hoping that by next year this time, you better position yourself. Okay? You better get your act cleaned up. You better get ready. But, but the prophet said, position yourself and stand still and see the salvation. Where have you ever heard that before? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. All of you looking like, at me like you never read the Bible. You remember when this whole host of people coming out of Egypt. Families and little children and cattle and they come to the Red Sea. Desert on the left. Desert on the right. The army of Egypt behind them. Red Sea. And what did God say? Jump in and, 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 and swim. What did God say? He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You are standing before a Red Sea today. You need to stand still. You need to keep quiet and start praising the Lord. You need to stop complaining and position yourself and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God is ready to show you something. But you're making so much noise and going on. Can I remind me of, of, well, we won't go there. But God wants you to position yourself and to stand still. Stand still. Who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem? Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow you go out against him, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord and worshipped the Lord. 
Jehoshaphat called a prayer meeting, got the people together, got them into worship, and changed the atmosphere. And the Spirit of God came down. And the Spirit of God always has the answer. Always. He called everyone into the presence of God. When we come into the presence of God, you see, sometimes I don't think we expect that to happen. Right here in the presence of God. That's why some people run all over town looking a blessing. They run all over town looking for somebody to put their hand on their head and tell them that this is going to happen. Your season is coming and all this kind of stuff. You don't need that. You don't need that. You need to seek God. And when you have prayed and when you have told God all you know and you have, you have repeated all the Bible verses you know and all of that stuff and, and you fasted and you prayed and start praising God because you expect the answer. Start worshiping God. Start, start blessing God for, because you know who he is. Because you, you, your faith has said he is coming. He will not tarry. The answer came. Because they were willing. Listen. Listen to verse 19. Then the Levites of the children of the Hukothites and of the children of Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. They, they weren't praise the Lord. They were praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants. Hey, full of power now, hey. Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and ye shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing. Is this man crazy? You're going to fight a battle with three armies and you're looking for people to sing? What kind of weapon is that? The Bible said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty, mighty, mighty through God to this pulling down of strongholds. Listen, when you sing with a voice of praise, you have the devil running. You have him worried. And so Jehoshaphat, is in, instead of looking for some sharpshooters, instead of looking for some skilled swordsmen, and then Benjamin, them Benjaminites or whatever, they were known to be sharp arrow shooters. I mean, them guys from, from Benjamin, man, they mean. He never looked for some people who can shoot good arrows. He's looking for people who can sing. The man wants a choir. But, but you need to know this, that Judah, even the name Judah, Judah means praise. And so when he got a choir of singers before him and they march out, just listen. They ain't, it's, this is not a little quiet prayer meeting because they're marching now. And it's not one of them, you know, holy, soulful song. Um, no, 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 no. It's, well, they climb on the city. They climb on the wall. And, and listen, this, these people are singing the praises of God and they're marching out there with all kind of swag and what have you because they're going in victory because they're trusting the God that they know and they have changed their atmosphere. And even though those guys are out there prepared to fight an ordinary battle, the battle we are fighting is a spiritual battle and we have already won. And praising God He's just appropriating it. That's what we're doing when we're praising God. We're appropriating the victory that we have. Praise the Lord, they said. For his mercy endures forever. Now, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, and who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to the place to overlook in the wilderness, they looked, and tor looked toward the multitude. And there were their dead bodies falling on the earth. No one had escaped. But it came about when they changed the atmosphere. They change it to one of worship and praise and adoration and letting God be God. Amen. They exalted his name. They begin to praise, sing praises. They begin to stand still and praise God. That's what standing still means. Begin to praise God. So don't back 
Don't back up. Don't back up. Look what happens when people begin to praise God. Let's read to the end of the chapter. Then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat in front of them to go back to Jerusalem with joy. For the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. So they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments, harps, trumpets to the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. Then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet for his God gave him rest all around. I like that. All around. Because the Bible says when a man's way pleased at the Lord, he make it even his enemies to be at peace with him. You know what? God wants to set up some ambushes. Set up some ambushes. I don't know why this God likes to make Satan look so small. Because he really is small, you know. He really is small compared to God. And, and sometimes God just lets Satan play his own game and fall right into his own, you know. But God set ambushes. You know, God is probably waiting for somebody to start praising him. You, do you think that could be? Do you think that could be the answer to your prayer? Because you see, God has heard you, okay? And he appreciates the things that you said about him and the things that you said from his word. And, 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 and you have seen some measure of answer to the prayer. You've seen some little changes and, you know, but somebody talk about, Lord, showers of blessing. God, little raindrops are falling here and there. And, and I see my brother over there getting blessed. So I know you answer prayer. But God, I want a shower. But, you know, God is probably saying, yeah, but why don't you start praising? If you expect, why don't you start praising? If that's your hope in you, why don't you start praising? Could we stand? I don't know what, where you are this morning. I don't know what your need is. And, and, and I don't know what, what fears are threatening you. But I want you to know this morning that you have a God who cares. And you have told him so many times. So if he didn't know before, guess what? He's heard you. But you know what? He sent to you this morning, position yourself. Okay? I don't have no prophecy to, to prophesy over you this morning about what's coming. But you know what I know is that? You position yourself this morning. Because the same God I trust is the God you trust. And I know he's a faithful God. And he says, you position yourself this morning, stand still and see the salvation. And, and when you stand still, pull out your tambourine. Hello. If you can't play guitar, you can hit the tambourine. Okay? Okay? And, 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 if, and, and if, you, if you can't do anything, offer him the instrument of ten strings. Here they are. You, you, you begin to praise him. You begin to worship him. You begin to honor him. You begin to say, praise God. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God, you're worthy, Lord. You can do it. I am trusting you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My victory is here. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.